In Narrowsburg, upstate New York, a barren patch of land that offers hints to a tragic story. Neighbors were waking up to, you know, in the dark, seeing this glow in the distance. Some people thought it was a sunrise. It wasn't. It was the light from the growing flames of a home ablaze. Inside, a woman, dead. So you knew the house was on fire? Yes. Did he say how he strangled her? Caught up in a murder story, Scott Sherwood, friend and colleague to Paul Novak. Paul Novak paid him to drive him upstate to kill his wife. Something Paul Novak denied as he feigned innocence. They, they told me that, at that point, they told me that a body was found there, but they weren't sure if it was Catherine's or not. She had been found lying on the basement floor on her back with her arms outstretched. She had been crushed at some point by falling debris when the house collapsed in the fire. Catherine Novak, mother of two small children, murdered, and her friends suspect foul play. I immediately thought, oh my god, she was murdered. Who was responsible for a brutal killing in an American backwater? Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the puzzle will reveal Paul Novak as guilty of murder? What would be the killer's mistake? Catherine and Paul Novak were part of a high octane world of New York paramedics. That was where their relationship would begin. Paul Novak met Catherine in the summer of 1996 at an ambulance corps barbecue. Emergency medical technicians, or EMTs, form close bonds. A decade later, Paul Novak would keep a conspiracy to murder in the EMT family as he enlisted the help of colleagues to end Catherine's life. He got a girlfriend to help him. Her name, Michelle LaFrance. What is he telling you that he wants to do, or how does that come about? That he was going to kill Catherine. And he says that to you. He got the chance to enlist the help of those who might be able to provide a little muscle, too, like Scott Sherwood. They were on an ambulance together as paramedics. I mean, you have a lot of downtime. They, they talked a lot. Why did he do this to Catherine? No, he said it to me because I don't want to end up like you. He manipulated someone into helping him commit a heinous crime and without even caring one whit as far as I'm concerned about what happened to Scott. Catherine Novak was most happy when living the life of a homemaker. After a tough childhood, she craved nothing more than stability, and her work would pay for that. She worked really hard to get where she wanted to be in life, so she worked odd jobs to be able to get the money that she needed to go to college and to um, complete her EMT training that she wanted to do as well. She joined the ambulance service in Queens, where she worked first as a dispatcher, then as a first responder. She was a very unusual type because of her sense of civic duty, her willingness to plunge in, donate her time to her church, to her community, to the school. Paul, on the other hand, was a thrill seeker. He was always broke too, blowing his income on electronics and fast bikes. He tended to spend his money on electronics and was perpetually fixing up motorcycles that he would then race around in the woods in upstate New York at 160 miles an hour. He was tall and strong, an imposing figure well-known in the Jamaica Hospital Ambulance Service where he worked. He reveled in his identity as a community crusader, saving lives night after night. 
in those days, right after 9-11 and at the very early years of the Iraq War, anyone with a paramedic uniform on from New York, you kind of assumed might have been a hero. He prided himself on his ability to bring victims of heart attacks and road accidents back from the dead. Some of those who knew him suspected that Paul got a kick out of having the power to save lives and pronounce death to appear the hero. Catherine, though, she just cared about the patients. Catherine and Paul were different, very different. None of their co-workers could understand the attraction between them. I think Paul Novak only cared about Paul Novak. On the surface, it didn't seem like their relationship would really work. Um, but she loved him. And on Valentine's Day, 1997, the two were married. She obviously sees the good in him to the point where she's willing to ignore any signs, any bad things that maybe kind of any red flags that maybe came up in the relationship. If Catherine thought she'd found her prince charming, she was very much mistaken. Paul was a man who was deeply flawed. He was somebody who would always be looking for the next thrill, the next high, the next woman, the next porn site that he would access even when sitting in his ambulance. And the behavior of Paul Novak within that community of paramedics, the adrenaline rush, the drug use, the porn addiction, all of it very dark, that, um, that was eye-popping. Paul Novak had the ability to do terrible things and not have a conscience about it. When Catherine Lane became Catherine Novak, she perhaps thought Paul would change. It was a vain hope. It's kind of a rocky start uh, throughout the first year of marriage because then Paul Novak, he applies for bankruptcy. Despite his steady job, he had wild spending habits which outweighed his salary. Catherine clung to the idea that becoming a family man would change him. They had two children, first a little girl, then, four years later, a boy. And in pursuit of the kind of childhood that she had never had, they moved their young family out of Queens. Within a few years of getting married, the couple had bought a house in Narrowsburg, New York, a tiny farming community that was outside of the city. Narrowsburg is a small, slightly run-down town of around 100 families two hours northwest of New York City. It lies in a secluded spot on the eastern banks of the Delaware River. Catherine had bought a house in the rural area outside of Narrowsburg, and it was a simple house, a little red and white house. Catherine was determined to raise her children somewhere safe, quiet, somewhere with a real sense of community, a world away from the bright lights, noise and anonymity of New York City. She had always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Her mother later said that she was the kind of person who wanted her children to look back on their house and say, that's the house that I grew up in. Well, she believes that she's starting this new life in a small town, and it's going to be bliss. Journalist and writer Nina Burley befriended Catherine when she moved to the town. I met Catherine when both of our children were five-year-old kindergartners at the Narrowsburg School, and she was um, just a mother, just like me. We both had five-year-olds and a toddler, and we got to know each other at the school. Every day we were dealing with the same things as mothers of uh, the, our first child going to school. And she was a lovely person. She was a great mother. She's got this perfect life. And she's married, in her mind, the perfect man as well, who's also saving lives. What could go wrong? I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Narrowsburg turned out to be far from a safe haven for Catherine Novak. It's a place where things can happen because it's a rural community and you're far from neighbors, you're far from the authorities, and on a dark night, um, a lot of things can happen if you have somebody with malign intent. Very early on, there were signs for Catherine that leaving the city had not meant leaving her problems behind. Paul insisted on keeping his job in New York, but he couldn't face the four-hour daily commute to and from Narrowsburg. Paul still worked in Queens, so he would sleep several nights a week in an apartment in Queens while Catherine stayed up in Narrowsburg 
with their new daughter. Her husband wasn't here very often. Her husband was a paramedic in New York, and he would show up on occasion to the morning drop-off wearing his uniform. Paul refused to embrace rural life. When he was around, he made no effort to get to know his family's new friends and neighbors. Her husband was kind of a quiet guy, I didn't really talk to him very much, a burly man who often showed up again in a uniform, and I didn't really get to know him because he wasn't around very often. Her friends described him as antisocial and a little bit creepy, but Catherine was willing to make excuses for him. Catherine, on the other hand, thrived in her new environment. She sometimes babysat for uh, my kids. Um, I, I would bring my son over to play with her daughter, and our toddlers would play together. And she was also somebody who volunteered a lot. She was donating her time to the school and making cupcakes and chaperoning children. She was a deacon in the local Lutheran church. She uh, led her daughter's Girl Scout troop. She helped out with the church. She helped out with the school. She was almost a semi-professional volunteer. Meanwhile, most of the time, Paul was 120 miles away, living a bachelor existence, free to indulge his worst excesses. It was much easier at this distance to keep his flaws a secret from his devoted wife. The real Paul Novak was cold, not social, um, had a porn addiction, was reckless in the extreme, was an adrenaline addict, as many EMTs will admit that they are. Meeting other women in the EMT Corps too, and telling them his side of a story of marital rows, one which was not even close to the truth. He had me convinced that Catherine was the bad guy and he was the good parent and these kids are abused and these kids are miserable we and, do this for the kids. and we need to save the kids. How long would it take before Paul Novak's behavior in the city would spill over into his quiet rural home life in upstate New York? In 2007, paramedic Paul Novak was living a high-stress, adrenaline-fueled existence. It was a lifestyle that inevitably took its toll. In one night, a New York City paramedic might deal with 50 heart attacks. I mean, it's an incredible job that they have to do, and um, clearly uh, it has an effect on their mental health. Theirs was a tight-knit community of hard-working EMTs who'd seen it all. Paul Novak himself would idle in his ambulance outside buildings that he knew had good Wi-Fi so that he could download hardcore pornography whilst on duty. It didn't seem to cross anybody's mind to blow the whistle when colleagues misbehaved. They even turned a blind eye when, out of the blue, Paul Novak began discussing how to commit the perfect murder. He had been talking about researching the perfect crime, how to hide a body, had left a trail of crumbs about his guilt um, before the murder happened. He was researching things on the internet. He was researching chloroform. You know, he was going to go, and, and he was looking into how he could do this and get it. Well, all of these EMTs in his um, station were aware of different facets of this, this malignant intent. And um, incredibly, not one of them picked up the phone and called the police. Around this time, Paul became increasingly bitter about his marriage, complaining that when he was at home, Catherine didn't pay him enough attention. Paul might have felt like he was playing second fiddle to some degree to Catherine's duties. She's becoming this am amazing individual in this small town community, and Paul Novak is now feeling very insecure about who he is as a person. He feels like he's a low man compared to his wife. He became resentful of the commute back to Narrowsburg, interested in other women too. Co-workers would later testify that he mused about ways to get rid of his wife. He told one colleague that fire was the best way to kill someone because it burned all of the evidence. Was cold and calculating and had been talking to his fellow paramedics about uh, how much he didn't like his wife, how happy he would be if he could get rid of her. Somebody overheard him say to his wife, you may be the, mo the mother of my children, but I can still kill you. 
At first dismissed as a joke, some of Paul's medic friends have since wondered if he was vetting them, gauging their willingness to help him dispatch Catherine Novak for good. Indeed, one of them took the bait. Scott Sherwood, a friend and co-worker who had recently been through a tough divorce, leaving him low on money and on self-esteem. His lawyer, Ben Greenwald, believes Novak targeted his vulnerable client. What could cause such a nice person uh, to do bad things? I think in this case, it's less looking at Scott Sherwood and more looking at Paul Novak's ability to manipulate. Back in 2007, Catherine Novak was completely in the dark about her husband's sinister intentions. He made a point of looking like he was trying to make a go of things. The marriage was in trouble, or at least it seemed to be to Catherine's friends. But on Valentine's Day 2007, 10 years after they first got married, the couple decided to renew their vows. Catherine's friends recall how happy she was about this. She said it meant a lot to Paul that he wanted a fresh start for their struggling marriage. Her friends wanted to believe this was the case, but they all thought he was simply doing it to keep his wife sweet. Not long after that, however, Paul took out a life insurance policy on Catherine. And it seemed a bit weird to her friends, but she defended it as a good decision for their children and their family, just looking out for the best interests of their family. The attempt to paper over the cracks in their marriage didn't last long. Later that year, Paul told Catherine that he didn't love her, that perhaps he never had. His visits to Narrowsburg became less frequent, and when he was there, he slept in the guest bedroom. Even the times that I would maybe drop off a kid at her house or interact with her at her house, I don't recall ever seeing him in that little cottage. One morning in February 2008, Catherine's worst fears for her marriage were confirmed. Her house phone rang. She ignored it, but it incessantly rang and rang again. When she finally answered, she heard a slurry female voice on the other end of the line. It was a young paramedic called Michelle LaFrance. She asked for Paul Novak, and it was at that moment that Catherine realized that her husband was definitely having an affair. And that's when her life crumbles. She's got two kids she's got to raise on her own with no job in this small town. Who was this woman intruding on Catherine's cozy rural life? Paul's uh, girlfriend was uh, an unstable character. Michelle LaFrance, a 25-year-old university student, had been assigned to the hospital ambulances group that Paul drove with. She'd had a history of suicide attempts, and her mental state was, at times, a bit shaky. She was not somebody who had any business being in charge of uh, life or death decisions uh, that are made by paramedics, and yet she was riding as a paramedic. She was, she was certified in New York. Paul Novak and Michelle LaFrance bonded over their shared experiences of life and death on the New York streets. He took her out for a drink to celebrate the first time that she'd successfully intubated a patient who was struggling to breathe. I mean, the whole story really uh, hinges on this, this underworld or this community of paramedics who, you know, were witnesses to uh, Paul Novak's bizarre behavior, witnesses to Michelle LaFrance's bizarre behavior. Paul had fallen hard for Michelle LaFrance. When she reciprocated, he must have thought he'd hit the jackpot. She was young, she was pretty, she was feisty. She looked up to him as a lifesaver, a hero. Catherine Novak, on discovering about the affair, kicked her cheating husband, Paul, out of their little home in Narrowsburg. I was standing in the yard and I said, hello, and she said, hello. And she said, oh, I've been looking for you. And right away she said, oh, I've been looking for you because my husband's having an affair and I need to get a job. And um, I said, oh, I'm sorry. And she sort of giggled and acted like it didn't matter that much that he was having an affair, didn't go into any of the details and just said, I need to get a job. Paul Novak also looked like he'd moved on. Soon after Catherine found out about the affair, Novak moved into an apartment in Glen Clove, Long Island with LaFrance. Novak agreed to pay $1,700 a month in child support and agreed to take the children every other weekend. 
Catherine tried to get on board with the new reality. She took on two part-time jobs at the school and a local church camp, telling friends she wanted to save money so her children could one day go to college. She wouldn't let the children visit their father in Long Island before she had vetted La France by taking her out to a local diner. There, she asked her husband's new girlfriend to help her shop for her son's birthday. But despite Catherine's best efforts, this was not an amicable separation. We can tell things are starting to take a downward spiral. Catherine filed for divorce and they began talking about a settlement. At the same time, Novak was starting to badmouth Catherine, calling her an unfit mother, calling her a fat, ugly troll. How he believes she's a terrible mother and how he is actually the victim, not Catherine. How he is the victim of having to deal with this woman who is so difficult and she falls for it. He had me convinced that Catherine was the bad guy and he was the good parent and these kids are abused and these kids are miserable. We need to do this for the kids. And we need to save the kids. The estranged couple argued bitterly on the phone about money and about who should care for their son and daughter. While she continued to present a smiling face to her friends and neighbors, Catherine felt less and less safe in her rural hideaway. He wants to move on with his life. He wants to put everything in the past, and everything starts to become about money. Catherine was increasingly anxious, and even though it doesn't seem like there were any direct threats against her safety, she did pay a neighbor to change the locks on the house. She was right to be scared. Her isolated backcountry home made her an easy target when Paul Novak decided that it was time to cash in on the life insurance. And we were up here for Christmas, and we were actually having uh, a holiday dinner at a friend's house outside of Narrowsburg, and the local paper was on the table. And I looked at it, and there was a color picture on it of a fire or a, a charred house, and underneath it said, local woman dies in fire. Had the lifesaver become a life taker? What story was unfolding upstate in New York? On the morning of the 13th of December, 2008, a community woke to smoke and flames pouring from Catherine Novak's home on County Road 25. Firefighters in Sullivan County were alerted to a fire. Some people thought it was a sunrise, but somebody nearby recognized it was a fire and called the police. Firefighters were on the scene by 6.46 that morning, and what they discovered was a fully engaged, raging fire. It was a cold morning, it was December. Um, the police arrived and the house was almost burned to the ground already. Despite the freezing temperatures, unusual even for a New York winter, it took them hours to extinguish the blaze. When they were finally able to sift through the debris, they made two gruesome discoveries in the basement of the collapsed house. Firefighters began the task of sifting through the ashes to see who might have even been in there. They found Catherine's body on the floor and the dog in a kennel also dead. Early conclusions suggested an accident. She had been crushed at some point by falling debris when the house collapsed in the fire. Devastating as it was, emergency workers were relieved that those bodies of a woman and of a dog were the only ones that they found in the charred wreck of the Novak family home. When firefighters searched through the debris, they weren't sure who they were going to find. They knew that two children lived at the address, but what they didn't know is that they had been spending the night at their father's house 100 miles away in Long Island that night. Detectives suspected that Catherine had been the victim of foul play. As they examined the crime scene and Catherine Novak's body, there were a number of clues that simply didn't add up. She had been found lying on the basement floor on her back with her arms outstretched. However, the back of her body wasn't burned. Fire investigation experts found it odd that Catherine was lying on her back. It's far more common when someone's been killed in a fire to find victims lying in a fetal position trying to protect themselves from the flames. There were other anomalies too. A post-mortem found that Catherine had not died of smoke inhalation as one might have expected. The medical examiner 
drew several conclusions from the autopsy. The dog had inhaled smoke, but Catherine had not. An autopsy later found that the levels of carbon monoxide in Catherine's lungs were not sufficient to kill her. Uh, instead, they believed that she had died when the debris crushed her chest. And there were people in the state police and in the, especially the fire department here who suspected that that was not accurate, but there was nothing they could do about it. If Catherine had not died from smoke inhalation or from being crushed by debris, what had caused her death? There was one final clue that indicated it may not have been accidental. She had three dislocated ribs and a strange pooling of blood around the sites of the fractures. This suggested to detectives that Catherine had been badly injured some minutes or hours before she had died. It showed Catherine may have suffered a violent assault. The finger of suspicion pointed towards Novak. I remember picking up the phone and calling the state police and saying, you're aware, of course, that she was engaged in a divorce. And he said yes. Police and firefighters had their suspicions at that point. Um, they questioned Paul Novak about his whereabouts that night. His girlfriend, Michelle LaFrance, said that he had been home all night. Paul Novak was adamant that he played no part in his wife's death. He later gave interviews where he protested his innocence, said that he had been shocked on hearing of the death of his former wife. I actually found out that they found a body in, in, the, uh, in the basement from my mother, who found out from one of the uh, volunteer firefighters that was there. So when I initially went to the state police as directed to, uh, to, give, you know, to give my statement as, as they wanted, they, they told me that, at that point, they told me that a body was found there, but they weren't sure if it was Catherine's or not. They interviewed him. He had an airtight alibi, and they let him go. And 10 days after the fire, Paul passed a lie detector test. They had really no choice but to rule it as an accident. Narasberg was left to mourn its unexplained loss. She was a born volunteer, a giver. and. There aren't a lot of people like that, and communities depend on them. So she left a hole in that sense. That's a loss for the community. She could have been somebody I could have seen running for office. Unlike the rest of the grieving community, Paul Novak showed no interest in paying tribute to his deceased wife. Paul didn't attend Catherine's funeral. Instead, he took the children, dropped them off at the service, and then picked them up afterwards. He didn't want anything to do with his wife in life or death. Perhaps he was too busy planning ways to spend the windfall that was coming his way. Not long after Catherine's death, Novak left his job as an EMT in New York City. Paul Novak then uh, cashed in an $800,000 insurance policy and moved himself and his girlfriend and his two kids to a house that he bought for himself in Florida with um, an in-ground saltwater pool and was aiming to live happily ever after. Paul's wife was dead. It had been ruled an accident. He had an attractive younger girlfriend, custody of his two children, and a lot of cash in the bank to fund a luxurious new lifestyle, miles from the dirt and noise of the big city. It could have been the perfect murder. But for Paul Novak, old habits were to die hard. Perhaps missing the adrenaline of being an EMT, Nostalgic for his secret trysts in the city, Paul's eye started to wander. Paul and Michelle's relationship was troubled, and by early 2012, Michelle believed that Paul was having an affair. Very soon after they were living together, uh, they started to fight. Paul joined an online dating site, and before long, he was seeing another woman behind Michelle's back. The medic seemed unable to stop his history of infidelity from repeating itself. By the summer of 2012, Novak and Michelle had split up. Eventually, she moved out of the house that she shared with him and the kids, moved into her own apartment in Florida, and would later tell police that she had dreams, nightmares, that he was coming to kill her in the way that he had killed Catherine. Life went on. Both of them found someone new. But whether inspired by guilt or a longing for revenge, Michelle couldn't shake the niggling feeling that she needed to come clean. He had described to her how he killed Catherine, strangled her to death, and she couldn't get that out of her head. 
and Michelle had started dating a police officer. And she started to feel a little bit guilty about some of the things that she had told the police in 2008 after the death of Novak's wife, Catherine. That police deputy urged her to contact the New York State Police. Michelle LaFrance made a phone call that would bring the world of Paul Novak crashing down. That summer, Michelle contacted the New York State Police, and in exchange for immunity, she told them that she had lied in her statement in 2008 about the death of Catherine. Paul only had himself to blame when Michelle LaFrance decided she was no longer willing to keep his dirty secret. If only he could have stayed faithful to his girlfriend, she might not have given this evidence to cops. What is he telling you that he wants to do, or how does that come about? That he was going to kill Catherine. Paul Novak's infidelity had caused his carefully constructed plan to unravel. The true story of Catherine's tragic death began to emerge. Was his lifelong infidelity about to become the mistake which would bring a killer to justice? In a police interview room, the woman who knew Paul Novak's secrets was telling all. It was going to be done on the weekend that we had the kids, and he was going to burn the house down. And, you know, he's up there in the middle of nowhere, and nobody would know, nobody would see. Investigators flew to Florida and interviewed LaFrance for more than six hours. She told them that she had lied about Paul Novak's whereabouts that night, and that instead of him being at home with her in Glen Cove, he and his sometime partner, Scott Sherwood, had actually driven to Narrowsburg, New York, set fire to the house where Catherine lived, and killed her. The reason why I think Paul Novak needed Scott Sherwood is that Paul didn't want his car to be traced to his ex-wife's house when he was going to try to murder her. Detectives had enough to arrest Paul Novak and his ambulance partner, Scott Sherwood. Paul denied everything. Did you kill your wife? No, I did not. According to his lawyer, the paramedic, Scott Sherwood, was relieved to finally be able to admit his role in the murder and the plot. He helped corroborate what Michelle LaFrance uh, testified to, and I truly believe everyone saw what type of person he really was. It's, you talked to him for a minute, you saw how earnest he was, that he truly wanted to do the right thing, and probably if it was up to him, he would have cooperated from minute one. Scott Sherwood pled guilty to conspiracy to commit murder, and in exchange for a shorter sentence, he agreed to testify against Novak. He told police and the jury what happened that night. Between LaFrance and Sherwood, detectives formed a crystal clear picture of the depraved plot that had led to Catherine Novak's violent death. I know it's not easy, but can you see anger building up in Paul, or is Paul talking about? Paul was very calm. Very calm? Very but did, calm, did he, did he... very controlled, very manipulative. Paul Novak wanted rid of his wife. He wanted to have their two children to himself. So in winter 2008, he started scheming. The plan came out in, uh, in probably November, December. December, probably. It, it was a very sh short time that I knew about. OK. And um, he was going to do this. He was going to do this and save the children. How does the conversation go? Like, what is he? What is he telling you that he wants to do, or how does that come about? That he was going to kill Catherine. And he says that to you. As a trained medic, Paul had worked out what he thought was the best way to kill his wife with a minimum of struggle and leaving behind as little evidence as he could. He was going to chloroform her, and leave her, and then burn the house down around her, and she was going to die of the fire. That was his plan. And um, we were going to do it on a weekend that, um, you know, we had the kids, the kids would be safe. Novak had it all worked out, but he needed an accomplice. He didn't want his car to be seen anywhere near Narrowsburg that night. Paul chose someone he knew would be easily manipulated. The guy who drove Paul Novak up here to commit the murder that night was a fellow EMT. Having someone else's car would be in his best interest. 
Why was this man, known as a gentle giant, willing to get involved in murder? Since Paul and Scott worked together as paramedics in Long Island, and uh, they are in the ambulances together, they went and they had a lot of downtime. They spoke a lot. And in the course of this, Paul learned a lot of intimate facts about Scott's life mostly about a messy divorce that he had been going through and the pain he was suffering because of that. Scott Sherwood, Novak's sometime partner, was a large man. He was also emotionally unstable. He'd recently gone through a divorce and had a history of bipolar dis disorder. He felt an affinity with Paul Novak. Scott, being the kind person that he is, wanted to try to help Paul with not being in pain. The problem is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Why did he do this to Kathy? Well, he said it to me because I don't want to end up like you. And you being, having gone through a very rough divorce and are in a very difficult predicament with your ex. And obviously you're not happy about that. You can manipulate even good people to do the wrong thing. And you just need someone with some very twisted morals to do that. With Sherwood on board, Paul Novak was ready to put his plan into action. On the night of December 12th, Sherwood went to Novak's Glen Cove apartment to pick him up. When he arrived, Novak was mixing up something that he said was chloroform. The children were fast asleep in the next room, drugged. Venadryl to the children so they wouldn't wake up when Paul was coming and going during the murder night. It seemed like Paul Novak had every detail buttoned up. Paul had indeed planned every detail of his road trip upstate with Scott. He'd even left his cell phone in Nassau County so that it wouldn't be tracked. While Scott was the chauffeur for the night, his attorney is adamant that he played no part in the violence that followed. Scott Sherwood's course of conduct for this was to drive Paul Novak up. He didn't go in the house, he didn't uh, do other things to advance the murder beyond driving him. On the way up to Narrowsburg, they stopped to buy duct tape and gloves. They parked a mile away, Scott's car hidden among the trees. Sherwood, the dutiful wingman, waited in the dark as he watched his friend approach the house where Catherine Novak, unsuspecting, slept in her bed. Sherwood told police that when he left the car, Novak was dressed in hospital surgical scrubs, he had booties over his shoes, was wearing a hat and gloves. He had also duct taped his sleeves and cuffs to make sure that no evidence would be left at the scene of the crime. Goes into the house, goes into the basement, sets off the smoke alarm, which then wakes Catherine up. She's alone in the house. She goes downstairs. What does he say happened inside the house? <sighs> he says it's to you, right, in the car? Yeah. He, he had said that the chloroform didn't work. I had to strangle her. Uh, Paul Novak tried to chloroform her, didn't work. A violent struggle began. I mean, he killed her. He strangled her to death. In her final moments, Catherine Novak knew exactly what was happening. Her husband took hold of her sweatshirt and tightened it around her neck until she stopped breathing. Did he say if Catherine mentioned anything during the struggle? Why are you doing this? And what was his response? Doing this for the kids. After setting the house alight and waiting for a while to make sure the fire took hold, Paul Novak returned to the car. He showed no sign of being shaken by the horrific scenes that he'd experienced moments earlier. What was his demeanor when he came back from the house? Um, seemed cold, distant. What about you? Were you like, holy f Why? I was... I was beside myself. Calmly, Paul Novak drove back to the city by a different route. And the last detail in Novak's meticulous plan was executed. When you leave, who drives? Um, I had Paul drive because, well, I started, I started heading out of the area, I guess, made it to the closest county road. And it was a little too windy and it was dark. 
So I told Paul, you better, you better drive, I can't. Along the way, they stopped at an abandoned gas station where Novak could get rid of the scrubs and the gloves. It came close to being, as Paul had intended, the perfect murder. Back home on Long Island, he told the whole sordid tale to his girlfriend, Michelle LaFrance. It was a huge mistake. Four years later, she would recount his actions, word for word, to detectives. After his arrest and throughout his trial, Paul Novak continued to deny his crime. And he continues to read me my Miranda rights, and I said, do I need a lawyer? He goes, well, you know, if you ask for a lawyer, it won't really look that good. We like you. We know you didn't have anything to do with this. But the DA wants us to ask you some questions just to keep you in the clear and make everyone feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right. I mean, I don't have anything to hide. You can ask me anything you want. And uh, so he's, then that's when he told me that something had happened to Catherine. I think Paul Novak only cared about Paul Novak, and he got a large sum of money from the insurance, which was pretty much all gone by the end of this case, where his kids pretty much got nothing as far as I understand. In court, Paul claimed that LaFrance and Sherwood had murdered Catherine without his knowledge. He really just wanted the case to go his way. So that that's the only thing I really can say he wasn't Paul Novak wasn't an open guy. But Novak's friend and girlfriend had no motive to murder Novak's wife, and their combined testimony was compelling. He helped corroborate what Michelle LaFrance testified to. A jury convicted Paul Novak of the murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. In return for his cooperation, Scott Sherwood was sentenced to just 18 months. The woman that Paul had fallen for, then cheated on, walked away from court. No charges were brought. Paul Novak's biggest mistake was trusting Michelle LaFrance. If their relationship hadn't broken down, it's possible that she would have kept his secret forever. Novak thought he could deprive the world of Catherine and get away with it. He was wrong. Paul Novak told all to Michelle LaFrance. He then cheated on her and expected her to keep his secret. That was his killer's mistake. A local politician with a fearsome reputation is in a coma in a Nevada hospital. It was jarring to think of her uh, going down like that. Her husband is quick to claim she's been struck down by a catastrophic illness. There was a television report on Kathy Augustine being in the hospital. It was kind of a press conference. Chaz Higgs was there, and he said she'd had a heart attack. Her friends don't believe it. Doctors are skeptical. They couldn't really find any reason why Kathy, 50 years old, never drank, didn't smoke, and worked out regularly, would have had a heart attack. Has the husband of an American politician found a way to commit the perfect murder? Has a narcissist killed a woman getting in his way? Murder is collateral damage on their life trajectory, on their series of exciting projects. A person is an obstacle to be discarded. Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the puzzle will reveal Chaz Higgs as guilty of murder? What would be the killer's mistake? Chaz Higgs and Kathy Augustine first locked eyes over the deathbed of Kathy's husband, Charles. Oddly, perhaps, given the circumstances, they felt a connection. Chaz would later say that they had chemistry, 
they had instant chemistry. And when they met in the hospital, it was just, it was one of those things. British forensic psychologist Donna Perry tracks the timelines of the lives of killers. She's been researching Chaz Higgs, and his behavior that day was very much in character. His romances mirror his, 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 whole, his whole approach to life. It, it's uh, uh, one passionate encounter fo followed by another. Charles Augustin, who was in the critical care unit of a Las Vegas hospital after suffering a massive stroke, was Kathy's third husband. By 2003, he and Kathy had been married for 17 years, but the relationship was on the rocks. Charles and Kathy Augustine were estranged and heading toward divorce um, when he fell ill. Friends suspected that their marriage had fallen victim to Kathy's soaring political ambition, something that she'd harbored since a girl and long before she met Charles Augustine, or Chuck, as he was known to friends. Chuck Augustine's wife, Kathy, was born Kathy Alfano in California. When she was growing up, her passion had always been politics, and she was growing up in the 60s and 70s at a time when women were leaving the house, attaining more. She was very highly educated. She had a bachelor's degree, she had a master's degree, and she had served an internship in Washington, D.C. around the time that she was in college. But then her plans were derailed by love, marriage, children. But then she got married twice, uh, divorced twice, had a young daughter, and uh, went to work for an airline. And she put her political ambitions aside for about 12 years. She began working for an airline, sometimes as a flight attendant, traveling around the world and around the country, and then later in, in scheduling. It was during this time that Kathy, who would tell friends she was lousy at choosing men, met Chuck Augustine. In 1986, Kathy met a Delta Airlines pilot called Charles Augustine. Charles Augustine was 15 years her senior. He'd been a, a football player earlier in life. He was also a Vietnam vet and a devout Catholic. Um, they fell in love and got married and moved to the Las Vegas area. For a few years, the couple were happy. They bought a large, luxurious home in downtown Las Vegas. The children from their former marriages got on well. It was a harmonious family. In time, Kathy started to feel the lure of politics once again. Her ambitions rekindled as she re-entered the Republican Party. Kathy Augustine was very well known in the state of Nevada. She was uh, known as a hard-charging, very strong, very dynamic uh, state politician. She uh, reveled in politics. She loved the rough and tumble of politics. Kathy campaigned to become a member of the Nevada State Assembly and she won. She served a term, then ran for the state senate, and again was successful. She had uh, run for and won election to the office of state controller of Nevada. She was actually the first female state controller in, in Nevada's history. She was the state's bill collector, more or less. You can't be a shrinking violet and have that job and be any good at it. And Kathy Augustine was very good at her job as state controller. But Kathy's political career didn't set well with her husband, Chuck. A quiet, conservative man, he didn't want to be in the limelight. He wanted to be at home, and he wanted his wife at home with him. Local journalist Victoria Campbell knew Kathy as a woman who wouldn't let anything or anyone stand in the way of her ambitions. I interviewed Kathy Augustine on numerous occasions. She struck me as tenacious, uh, very tough. She was a very tough woman and tough to talk to sometimes. She just had her eyes on what she wanted. She was ambitious. The pressure that that put on her relationship was starting to, to show. And by 1998, they were separated. Charles and Kathy Augustine were estranged and heading toward divorce um, when he fell ill. In 2003, when Charles Augustine was hospitalized following a stroke, he and his wife still shared their Vegas home. But they'd been living separate lives for almost four years. Kathy was buying herself a smaller property over 400 miles away in Reno, closer to her work at the state capitol. Despite this, she was a frequent visitor during the six weeks that her husband spent in hospital. And it was here that she met critical care nurse Chaz Higgs. William Charles Higgs was also someone with a checkered relationship history. 
Not a lot is known about Chaz Higgs' early life, but between 1984 and 2002, he had three failed marriages. He changed state and job quite a lot and drifted. Chaz was raised by his father, who was in the Marines. My sense is that he came out of quite a hard background, a background where he didn't learn uh, how to care about other people because uh, it was a tough background where other people weren't particularly caring about him. It fits with the idea of an upbringing led by a military man. Chaz Higgs followed his father into the armed forces. He trained as a Navy SEAL and spent 16 years as a medical corpsman looking after the health of sailors in naval clinics and at sea. Along the way, there were three failed marriages and many accusations of infidelity. Chaz moved around a lot and filed for a string of bankruptcies as he did. We've got somebody who has an inability to self-regulate, somebody who's always looking for excitement, somebody who's immature, and somebody who is very emotionally fluent, is very, is very warm and charming and open. Put all those things together and you get somebody who is going to move from woman to woman very readily and, and is going to appeal to a lot of women as well, so it's easy for him to do that. But things looked like they were about to take a turn for the better in the life of Chaz Higgs. Was he finally ready to settle down? By 2002, after the breakdown of his last marriage, Chaz was living in Nevada. He had seemed to be a bit more stable. He took a number of medical qualifications and in 2002 received his state nursing license. He got a post at the Sunrise Medical Center in Las Vegas as a critical care nurse. He was living in an RV but he seemed to be moving towards an actual career by now. Had Chaz Higgs finally found his calling? He seemed to take to nursing like a duck to water, but it wouldn't be long before he was putting his medical training to more nefarious uses, and his new wife, Kathy, would be playing the unfortunate patient. He would have been comfortable going into nursing, of holding other people's lives in his hands because, not because he cared so much, but because actually other people's lives were so unimportant to him, certainly much less important than Chaz Higgs's life. The descent to murder had begun in the emotionally charged atmosphere of a Las Vegas hospital's critical care unit where Nevada State Controller Kathy Augustin had met the charismatic, handsome nurse, eight years her junior, who found her as captivating as she found him. Chuck Augustine spent six weeks at the intensive care unit, and during that time he had a number of visitors, including his wife, Kathy. He suffered a minor stroke at their home in Las Vegas, was taken to the hospital, then suffered a major stroke in the hospital and uh, while he was being treated and was seriously ill. One of his nurses was Chaz Higgs. After six weeks, he unfortunately passed away, but Kathy's relationship to the intensive care team at the hospital didn't end there. Chaz would later say that they had chemistry and when they met in the hospital, it was just, it was one of those things. Whether by accident or design, soon after her husband's death, Kathy found herself seeing the nurse again. Kathy wrote thank you notes to all of the staff, but she forgot to write one to Chaz. In order to make up for that, she decided to invite him out for coffee, and that was when their romance began. It was the classic whirlwind romance. Kathy and her late husband had a holiday planned, a luxury trip to Hawaii. Suddenly facing the prospect of spending the break alone, Kathy invited her new lover, Chaz Higgs. Chaz and Kathy's relationship progressed quickly, very quickly. Within three weeks, they had gotten married on a holiday to Hawaii. I would venture to say that Kathy Augustine probably hoped for what most people hope for, a meaningful, happy relationship. And this being her fourth marriage, um, it was not something that she had been able to have before. For Kathy, for, who, who was perhaps used to more intellectual, reserved man who was part of a, a, a calculating political world, Chaz actually would have been a breath of fresh air in his warmth, his openness. Kathy Augustine told her family, uh, he's an angel to me. He swept me off my feet. 
Those closest to Kathy were skeptical. It was hard to see them as a match made in heaven. But I think there were probably some questions and, you know, people kind of looking askance at that relationship and wondering what she saw in him and what he saw in, in her. They were both very dynamic, attractive people, but whether they belonged together, I think, I think there were a lot of questions asked about that. The relationship between Chaz and Kathy was not something that their friends could have predicted. She was eight years his senior, and they didn't really seem to have a ton in common. Despite their reservations, all Kathy's friends wanted was for her to be happy, and for the first few months, that's how she seemed to be. At the start of their relationship, things seemed to be going very well. Kathy gushed to her friends that she'd never been happier. Straight out of the gate, it appeared that she was happy. Chaz was athletic, had always been interested in keeping up his appearance and looking good. Um, over the course of their relationship, however, he got Kathy into shape, he got her interested in working out, and they seemed to be ticking along fairly well. Chaz enjoyed a new, comfortable, even luxurious lifestyle, something he'd never had in the Navy or on a nurse's salary. It was made possible by marrying Kathy. By that time, she had also received the payout from Chuck's life insurance, which amounted to about a million dollars. The warning signs were perhaps there. When she met him, Chaz was bad with money, but Kathy was smitten. She sang her new man's praises to her friends and family. He had always been terrible with money, and friends suspected that part of Kathy's appeal in the first place was that she was fairly wealthy. Chaz seemed drawn to Kathy's status as a well-known politician. She was almost a celebrity. She was an easy route to success. She had glamour, she had status potentially. He, he thought that she was an easy route to the fairy tale ending that he believes is his destiny. But it was also this very aspect of Kathy's life and personality that quickly began to drive a wedge between the couple. He wanted her to quit politics. When she didn't quit politics, it aggravated him. On some level, he knows that he can't function in, in the grown-up world uh, like the political world. Chaz Higgs also did not have any interest in politics whatsoever, and he hated going to the dinners and the public events, and he had absolutely no interest in that. In 2004, the marriage was already foundering. She was moving things out of um, Chaz's name and into a trust that would go to her daughter. In September of that year, Kathy was impeached for a campaign ethics violation and was forced to fi pay a fine of $15,000. That seemed to derail her political career somewhat and she had to work to recover her good name. In 2004, Kathy became the first Nevada state constitutional officer to be impeached by the assembly. She was found guilty and censured, but she was allowed to remain in office. The episode hit her reputation, though, and her wallet. She was fined a record $15,000 and made 500 pounds a month payments on the fine until November 2005, when she paid off the balance five months after refinancing her Las Vegas home. Whether frustrated that money had become tighter, annoyed that his wife was no longer the celebrated local figure he'd married, or resentful at how much time Kathy was spending rebuilding her career, Higgs started acting up. The stress of that situation may have caused more problems in their relationship. By autumn of 2005, Chaz was really bad-mouthing Kathy quite a lot to colleagues at work. He wanted her to uh, lose weight. He called her a fat bitch and, and that sort of thing. Clearly, they were not getting along. Um, they just didn't mesh. Um, he didn't like the scene she was in. Um, she wanted him to, to like it and to go with her to these events and things, and he just didn't want any part of that. Chaz became increasingly vain, even obsessive about his appearance. Was he perhaps looking for a new way to gain status and excitement? He'd also gotten into bodybuilding and was spending most of his nights at the gym. Chaz had also gotten into steroids and was stockpiling medicine at home. These Peter Pan figures, uh, emotional Peter Pan figures, are also incredibly immature. And you, we see evidence of that in the unrealistic approach that they take to life. They're, they're forever getting into problems with their money, becoming bankrupt. They're forever taking on some new project with, with a ridiculous, intense ardency for, for, for a while. 
By early summer 2006, Chaz Hicks seems to have come to a decision. Just as he had set his mind at different times to finding a wife, becoming a nurse or getting fit, now he was setting his mind on his next project, getting out of his marriage. He made no attempt to hide this desire from fellow nurses. Anytime he was busy and they, one of them would say, and all of them testified to this, and there were several, one of them would say, is there anything I can help you with? And he said, yeah, get rid of my wife. Chaz Higgs made no secret of his growing resentment of his wife, Kathy. He joked frequently about getting rid of her. He was saying terrible things about his wife to his co-workers. If I didn't have a daughter in Las Vegas, I would kill my wife and throw her down a mine shaft. He started a flirtatious relationship with a colleague, Linda Ramirez. He emailed her saying, you've touched my heart and I want to be with you. Three years after they got married, Chaz was cautioned by his superiors for using his email, his work email, to send flirtatious messages to a colleague. He had been romancing other women, that he had joined a, a website called passion.com and was sending emails to other women. These emails would later prove interesting to Chief Deputy District Attorney Tom Bob. And we had witnesses as far as he was flirting with one of the people that worked at the hospital. He was, you know, say, he sent her an email, said, I'm going to make Kathy, he said that bitch, Kathy's life miserable. Again and again, Higgs blurted out his darkest thoughts and feelings. This lack of discretion would very soon come back to haunt him. In the meantime, he was summoned to his manager to explain why he'd been misusing his hospital email account. He uh, said he was reaching out to these other women because he was sad, he was angry, he was venting. He confided to his supervisor, Tina, that things with Kathy were problematic. He described her as abusive and controlling, and Tina started to get concerned. Worried about her employee's personal safety, Tina offered Chaz somewhere to go should he ever need it. Tina suspected that Chaz might be the victim of abuse, so she offered him a place to stay if he needed it. Somehow, word of this got back to Kathy, increasingly desperate for the state of her marriage and suspecting that this other woman was making a play for her husband, the once strong, dignified, intimidating politician lost her composure. Kathy somehow found out and began harassing Tina at her place of work. Uh, eventually, Kathy wrote threatening letters to Tina, and Tina eventually took the matter to the hospital board. And after that, Kathy's harassment seemed to stop. Kathy was clinging to the relationship, determined this one was going to last the course. She tried to speak to Chaz about their crumbling marriage. He refused to talk. Eventually, she kicked him out for emptying their bank accounts and then let him move back in. She told this friend that Chaz had said he wanted to leave her, and she didn't want him to leave. She wanted to make a go of it. She wanted it to work. Kathy's friends and family would later recall that she seemed to have become scared of what her unpredictable husband might be capable of. While Chaz was making it seem to Tina that he was being abused, the evidence seems to suggest that maybe something else was going on. For example, Kathy called her brother one day from the car, crying, sobbing, and saying, he's going to kill us both, because Chaz was driving erratically crazy. She was right to be frightened. At 6.45 AM on Saturday, 8th of July, 2006, Chaz Higgs dialed 911 from Kathy's house in Reno. Higgs is on the telephone, 911, my wife is not breathing, uh, I need help. He said he had found his wife in her bed, unresponsive and not breathing. The dispatcher taking the call would later report that he'd never heard someone so calm in such a situation, who could give such detailed directions to the home and carry on such a lengthy conversation. Why wasn't Chaz Higgs panicking? He was real kind of nonchalant about the whole thing. Everybody commented about his, his demeanor, his tone of voice, that sort of thing on the 911 call. When the call was later played in court, everyone listening was struck by how calm and unruffled Hicks seemed to be. He talked at a normal pace in almost a monotone as he began. Something's wrong with my wife, she's not breathing. She's not breathing at all? Not breathing at all. He didn't seem to be too affected by 
the fact that his wife wasn't breathing or anything like that. A little later, Higgs said that she had no medical problems that he was aware of, but did accept she'd been stressed over the previous six months. When the ambulance folks arrived, uh, she was still on the bed. Uh, and I, I think they found a faint heartbeat. Chaz told paramedics that he had attempted resuscitation, but when they arrived, they found her still in the bed. This was suspicious because as a trained medical professional, he should know that in order to resuscitate someone, they have to be on a hard surface, not a soft bed. The situation seemed odd, even sinister, but there was little time to lose in trying to save her life. They did resuscitate her enough to get a heartbeat, blood pressure, that sort of thing going. And then they put her in the ambulance and took her to the uh, renowned Med South. As Chaz accompanied his wife to hospital, ambulance staff could not help but notice his cool demeanor, even as the blue lights flashed and the sirens blared. He was even reading a newspaper. As they hooked the now comatose Kathy Augustine up to the life support machines at the nearby hospital, nurses began to ask themselves how this strong, fit, feisty politician had ended up so gravely ill. The first nurses said, this doesn't look right. She's not, you know, 50 years old, no history of anything. Doesn't look like heart attack to me, or at least the normal heart attack protocol. Some very alert nurses thought this just didn't look right. She was a very vivacious, apparently healthy 50-year-old woman. And that's not that's not normal for her to just come in in uh, a comatose state for her heart to stop and she stops breathing and paramedics have to revive her and rush her to the hospital. What had Chaz Higgs done to his wife? Three days later, as Kathy's family considered whether her life support should be switched off, detectives also began to question what actually had happened. To put it all together, that was the challenge. How do you, how do you go from a healthy 50-year-old female to a dead 50-year-old female? The day after he called paramedics to their home in Reno, Chaz Higgs told assembled reporters about the medical condition of his wife, State Controller Kathy Augustine. It was kind of a press conference. Chaz Higgs was there. Higgs told the press that Kathy had suffered from heartburn and stomach pains in the day before, and that he believed that it was a cardiac arrest as a result of campaign stress. And he said she'd had a heart attack. I don't know where he got that information or what, what made him say that. Higgs suggested that his wife may have fallen victim to the stress of hard work and long days. To Kathy's family and friends, that simply didn't ring true. They knew her as a person who thrived on stress, and something like that wasn't enough to do it. The scuttlebutt was that it may have been a heart problem, and of course, that's not always obvious, and, and people get sick and, and die every day from heart problems. Kathy's doctors were baffled. In the run-up to her so-called heart attack, she'd been in good health, and when they examined her, they could find nothing to explain her condition. Doctors, meanwhile, couldn't find any evidence of heart disease, and they couldn't really find any reason why Kathy, 50 years old, never drank, didn't smoke, and worked out regularly, would have had a heart attack. If there had been a heart attack, except for the, I guess there, there are exceptions to every rule, but if there had been a heart attack, there, there would have been evidence in the heart muscle or in the arteries uh, around the heart, that sort of thing. And there was none of that. As Kathy's condition deteriorated, and with her extended family by her bedside, her estranged husband, Chaz, was taking care of business. And then the news just became progressively worse. Um, she was in a coma. She was had irreversible brain damage. Kathy was in a coma for three days. And during that time, Chaz made sure that her $1,100 a month state pension was signed over to him. And it would be his $1,100 a month for the rest of his life. Now, nobody thought that was an extremely large amount of money, but I'm thinking I could live, you know, pretty, pretty well with $1,100 a month more than I was working for. Colleague was struck once again by Higgs's demeanor when they saw him. He didn't seem like a man whose wife, a woman he professed to love, was lying desperately unwell in hospital. 
The day after she was admitted, he went to go pick up a paycheck from a colleague and even brought that colleague a box of donuts as a thank you. He was checking on her pension. He was bringing donuts to the nurses. He was not always, as nurses would later testify, behaving as a husband who was deeply concerned about his wife, who was lying there in a comatose state. How was Chaz Higgs able to carry on seemingly without a care in the world? Was he in shock? Was he putting on a brave face? Or was it because Kathy's condition was exactly what he wanted? After three days, it became clear she wasn't going to regain consciousness. Her family made the agonizing decision to turn off her life support. It was a body blow, not only for those who knew and loved her, but for all of her supporters. On July 11th, 2006, Kathy's family made the decision to take her off of life support, and she died. When news came that Kathy Augustine had died in the hospital, that life support had been terminated three days in, I think the public felt terrible for her and for her family. We had lost someone who held a very high office in this state, who had blazed a trail for female politicians, for all politicians, uh, and she was gone. As Kathy's family prepared to bury her, Chaz Higgs at last showed some sign of being affected by the tragedy. On July 14th, Chaz Higgs attempted suicide. He was found by Kathy's daughter, Dallas, having slit his wrist and was briefly hospitalized. He missed Kathy's funeral. She slits the wrist, but not very well, and lays down in the bathtub in the house that he and Kathy had in Las Vegas. Uh, wrote a big, long note. Um, blaming other people in this world, signs it sincerely Chaz Higgs. Uh, uh, it says, I'm going to see my wife. Did Chaz Higgs really intend to kill himself? And if he did, what was he feeling? Grief, remorse, or something else? The suicide attempt following the murder is one of the most psychologically revealing of all factors here. The fact that even this has to become about Chaz is terribly revealing. And I, I don't think for a minute that he wasn't suffering the pain, uh, but the fact that it was the a pain produced by him, himself, is again just a classic symptom of the immaturity, of the, the lack of, of self-regulation, of self-analysis, of self-awareness, of, of these type of Peter Pan psychological characters. With a cloud of suspicion still hanging over what happened to Kathy, there was an autopsy. It failed to establish a cause of death. Doctors and police were mystified. Nothing was found in the sense of a cause of death. Um, found that her heart was in good shape, that her lungs were in good shape. Uh, there was no evidence of, of a brain bleed or anything like that. But they did have a breakthrough of sorts. They came across something during the post-mortem examination of Kathy's body that no one could explain. And it reinforced the suspicions that investigators had that Kathy may have been the victim of foul play. There was a, a puncture wound on her hip. It had turned black and blue a little bit, uh, as if whoever did it was in a rush or didn't know quite the, you know, how to get it done without hurting somebody. Neither the hospital nor the paramedics had administered a drug to Kathy via an injection in her hip. No one could explain it. When samples of Kathy's tissues and blood were examined by the hospital toxicologist after her death, they found only traces of drugs that had been given to Kathy legitimately by the doctors, nurses, and paramedics who'd been caring for her. The blood and tissue samples came up with nothing. Uh, when the autopsy was finished and there was no apparent cause of death um, that resulted from that, those tests, I think all of us knew something was up. So it was just, I have no case, there's nothing to prosecute, uh, she just died. Chaz, meanwhile, was ready to move on with his life. The wounds from his apparent suicide attempt were healing. Newly widowed, he had his job. He had Kathy's pension. It looked as though whatever he'd done to his wife, he was going to get away with this. I didn't have enough information to question the death, and I didn't have enough information to say, oh, she just died. Unbeknownst to Chaz Higgs, investigators were not ready to let go of their suspicions. 
In fact, while Kathy was still alive, lying in a critical care bed, fighting for survival, two things had happened that would later help prosecutors nail Chaz Higgs for his crime. The first was that quick-thinking nurses trusted their gut instincts when Kathy was rushed into hospital. Something simply didn't add up about her condition. She or they, the two of them, decided to take the body fluids from Kathy right upon her entry in the, into that hospital. They were taken, were removed to the lab area of that hospital, refrigerated. These very alert nurses took blood samples and urine samples and put them in a refrigerator under an assumed name. This doesn't look right. We're taking the fluids. Thank you. The second thing that happened a day or two later was that Kim Ramey, a colleague of Higgs, got in touch with the police. She reported a conversation that she'd had with Higgs at work on July the 7th, the day before his wife was taken ill. Chaz confided in a co-worker that he was considering divorce. Later that same day, with the same co-worker, Kim Ramey, he happened to mention a news story in which a husband had killed his wife. Chaz Higgs said he did it all wrong. If I'm going to kill someone, I'm just going to hit him with a shot of sucks or succinylcholine. And he made the injection kind of movement with his hand. Um, and she, she said that scared her a good deal. She said the hair on her arms stood up. He said that it would have been much better if the husband had used succinylcholine because that particular drug, a paralytic that's very frequently found on crash carts in intensive care units and emergency rooms, isn't traceable after death. The drug is quick acting as far as paralyzes quickly. Uh, it's also quick acting as far as it moves out of the system quickly. And it was because of Kim Ramey that the case really took off and they knew what to test for and they knew what to look for because of a, a comment that he had made. If this was really what Chaz Higgs had injected his wife with, it was a remarkably cruel way to kill her. Succinylcholine is used by anesthesiologists to paralyze the, the uh, throat muscles, the lungs, uh, so that they can in intubate a person uh, without causing too much harm and without much fight back from them. It's a general paralytic, um, but when too much is given, it can be fatal. And even more horrifically, the person is often aware of what's happening, and it takes about six to 10 minutes to die. They can feel it the entire time. I think what struck me most about this case was how cold and how calculated this death was. Imagine giving someone a drug that stops them from breathing and stops them from crying out or calling for help or moving. A drug that's going to make someone suffocate to death in front of you. For six or eight minutes, they know they're going to die and there's nothing they can do about it. It's an agonizing death. It's part and parcel of somebody this naive and uh, self-centered that the drug he chose was one that caused a lot of suffering to the victim. He, he just wouldn't have thought that through properly. Chaz Higgs had chosen this method to kill Kathy Augustin because the drug wouldn't be detected post-mortem. But quick-witted medical staff treating Kathy had taken samples from her while she was still alive. And after Kim Ramey's phone call to police, they knew exactly what they should be looking for. Those nurses had not gone in and gotten those fluids. It would have been a whole lot harder, if not impossible, to make a case against Chaz Higgs. We sent the, the body, the tissue samples and the fluids to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia, where they began testing them. This was in, in July. A waiting game began. Despite everything, despite him telling colleagues he wanted his wife dead, despite his boasting about the best way to kill someone, if the toxicology report had come back clean, detectives would simply have not have had the evidence they needed to prove that Chaz Higgs was a killer. But you're waiting two months, two and a half months, to get evidence that there even was a crime. We didn't know what was happening behind the scenes as far as, um, you know, body fluids and tissue samples being head to, sent to the FBI laboratory in Virginia. We didn't get the results back till September 26th, I think. 
September 26th, investigators got the news that they'd been waiting for. Traces of the anesthetic drug succinylcholine had been found in the samples sent to the FBI. Police put out a warrant for Chaz's arrest, and on September 29th, 2006, he was found and arrested in Hampton, Virginia. It was at this point that detectives were able to seize even more evidence that would prove beyond a doubt that Chaz Higgs had poisoned his wife. When they came to search his car, they almost couldn't believe their luck. At the time of his arrest, he was carrying a backpack that contained a nursing manual. There was a bookmark on the page about administering sakinacholine. There was a packet of three by five cards, for lack of a better description. And the very top one was a, a, a card that dealt with succinylcholine, administration, use, that sort of thing. For a man concerned with committing the perfect murder, how had Higgs come to leave such an incriminating trail of evidence? People like this do often get caught by the carelessness, the, uh, which is typical of such egocentric people. They're so unconcerned with other people that the, the flip side is that they're very unaware of the clues that they're leaving. Despite making it easy for prosecutors to prove his guilt, Higgs flatly denied he had anything to do with Kathy Augustine's death. He said, I, I love my wife. I wouldn't do that. What I wanted to do, or what the purpose of my cross-examination was, was to point out to everybody within hearing distance that what he said was complete and utter junk. None of his stories stacked up. He told lie after lie. The jury bought none of them. He just wasn't believable in anything he said. He was just a liar. Chaz Higgs' trial continued through 2007, and on June 29, 2007, he was convicted. He was sentenced to life in prison, and he almost immediately went on suicide watch. Higgs' defense team attempted an appeal, but in May of 2009, the Supreme Court of Nevada upheld the conviction. He got uh, life with the possibility of parole after 20 years. In the end, Chaz Higgs might have been a trained nurse, but his personality was fatally flawed. The way he went about killing his wife would have been clever if he'd been able to resist boasting about it. When he mouthed off to his colleagues, he gave detectives the impetus to pursue him. Chaz Higgs's biggest mistake was telling Kim Ramey that the best way to kill someone was to use sakinocholine because it couldn't be traced. And once he thought he was home and dry, Higgs made little attempt to cover his tracks. That big mistake then put a spotlight on all of his littler mistakes, including having a nursing handbook with a bookmark on the page about administering sakinocholine. The absolute self-centeredness, which, which made it possible, made it easy for Chaz to discard of Kathy, um, also, in the end, uh, trips him up, uh, produces the carelessness in his behavior which trips him up. As a man and as a killer, Chaz Higgs was fatally flawed. His selfish pursuit of the projects that excited him led him through four marriages, a handful of bankruptcies, and eventually the callous murder of his wife, Kathy Augustine. Unable to keep his obsession to himself, he blurted out bits of his plan to co-workers and friends. And unable to see beyond his immediate desire to kill his wife, he left behind a trail of clues. Clues which added up to the killer's mistakes. <laughs>